All right, dudes. I think we're finally live. Of course, technical difficulties. I I don't know how some of these live streamers do it. Uh, it is absolutely... <laughs> It is always a challenge. Like you get one camera setting changed, you update something, and then you have like a, a setting that you have to re-log in on. And then there's Facebook needing authorization for this and authorization for that. Oh my gosh. So anyways, and not to mention I've had like a whole morning full of Zoom calls. But anyways, super excited to, to be back for the live edition of the QA. My name is Dave Tim. I am your host. This is the June 2023 edition of the QA live coming at you. And we'll be answering all your questions. I'm just uh, making sure everything's working good. It looks like I do have a lot of comments. Uh, looks like mainly from Facebook. I'm sorry, from YouTube. So I'm not sure if anyone's watching on Facebook or not. But we should be transmitting live to both our Facebook page, Guns and Tactics, and our YouTube channel, Guns and Tactics, which is where it looks like the majority of our watchers are uh, currently tuning in from is from YouTube, it looks like here. So uh, as always, we will be answering your questions. We'll be uh, interacting with comments and all that stuff, and uh, we'll be having a good time. And uh, I'm looking forward to starting the show. I love doing these at the end of every month. I love uh, answering questions and interacting with you guys. It is one of the highlights of my month, believe it or not, even though it's kind of a simple show. And it's, uh, but it's I don't know, it's something that we've that we've uh, come to like. At least I have, and hopefully you guys have too. So we definitely have uh, a couple dozen or so give or takes. And it looks like you guys were commenting before it started uh, asking about severe weather. Uh, although we, yeah, the only storm I've had is like the tech storm of, of crap not working well or whatever. So the joys, the joys of technology, but we're here and uh, yeah, in metric time, you know, whatever. Right? Right, Chris? This is just how it goes. So, all right. Uh, let me just do another comment check. And yes, I know there's no Tumblr, Dustin. There is no Tumblr. I I know I have an empty glass and unfortunately now that my kids are home for the summer, I can't even like tell them to like bring me something. It's not, I think it's kind of beyond their, their wheelhouse. So, uh, although the weird thing is, is that I'm posting, there we go. All right. It looks like finally the comments are posting as they should. Uh, I do love the live streaming and the software makes it so much easier and, and all that kind of thing. But, uh, it's definitely, it seems like it's, there's always something, right? There's just there's always one little thing that changes, or one update, or or one little thing that it, uh, definitely makes things not as easy as they should be. So before we get rocking and rolling, I do want to give a quick shout out, obviously again to Global Ordnance. They are the sponsor of the show. Why? See, and then again, this is this is why I don't understand. Uh, our streaming software because now it's changing cameras on me. It's showing the, the laptop camera, which is clearly not what I want it to be. I want it just to be the logo. Uh, but this is just the joys of of live streaming. So let me sc scale this here. Uh, the Global Ordinance is our sponsor. I uh, can't thank them enough for sponsoring the prize. They also provide all of the ammunition that we use on the channel. Got to love Global Ordnance. They carry all of your ammunition needs. They carry the mainstream calibers that you need for training and practice, but also all of the stuff that you need for hunting, competition, whatever it might be. They import gazillions of rounds of ammo all the time, and they have great prices, and they offer free shipping. I'll put a code in the description once we get the show notes going. And I also got to give a shout out to TriggerCon, which is coming up in September. And in fact, if you guys want some tickets, I will be more than happy to give away some free tickets if you can use them for uh, our viewers, and you can come hang out. That's September 22nd through the 24th, 2023, in Wichita, Kansas. And I did meet somebody who was not familiar from the Midwest, and they were like, Wichita? Where's Wichita, Kansas? You know who you are if you're watching. I thought that was kind of funny. But if you guys want to hook up on some tickets, let me know, and I can hook you up. Otherwise, tickets are very reasonably priced, and the lineup at the show is arguably the best I've ever seen it. So super excited for TriggerCon 2023. Come hang out. Let's do it to it, TriggerCon. It's always going to be awesome. Last but not least, huge shout out to our Patreon supporter, uh, supporters. They uh, have a little bit more going on. I'm trying to be a little bit more active with Patreon, uh, interacting with them, kind of giving them some sneak peeks. We might do some live only P Patreon, stuff like that. So our high level patrons, we do appreciate their support. Back to the show. So we got all that out of the way. Uh, let's start out with some comments. This is from Ryan. Ryan, LPVO versus red dot magnifier. What's your preference or LPVO, red dot, etc.? Great question. What I can say with that is that uh, generally speaking, if you're forcing me to pick one, I'm going to pick an LPVO, a good quality LPVO. 
However, other advantages to a red dot with a magnifier? Yes, absolutely. So before I commit to my LPVO statement, which I still will stand by, I'll say it with this. A red dot is awesome for most things, right? And the cool thing with a magnifier is it is modular. So if you don't want it on there, let's say you're taking a carbine class and it's a 50 yard class, boom, you just pop off the magnifier. You have your lightweight red dot rig, works out awesome. Uh, no problems whatsoever, right? You can save money. You can kind of configure it as you need. The downside with magnifiers is they can be a little clunky. Sometimes eye placement is a little bit more critical. It adds weight. It adds bulk. You have this thing hanging off the side. Uh, if you're really cool, you have one of the Unity ones that drops down, which is actually on a rifle just over there, but I can't show rifles on live streams. Uh, so I do like the Unity. If I was running a magnifier, it'd be that Unity tactical mount that just drops straight down. That's my favorite mount for magnifiers. Uh, and then obviously, depending on the optic, it's either going to magnify everything, including the dot size, although on an EOTech it doesn't, which is kind of some voodoo. So I actually have the EOTech system on that particular rifle, and I do like that for a red dot and a magnifier. I'm starting to warm back up to EOTech a little bit. Uh, however, all that being said, I generally, if I had to pick one optic to leave on a rifle, it's going to be a good quality 1-4 to four or 1-6 to six, uh, because it's always there. They're like a good quality LPVO is just as fast on that 1X. They do have some daylight bright models now, but then as I need to, I can kind of dial in that magnification where I need it, whereas with a magnifier, it's either all or nothing. So a good quality LPVO. Uh, I have some LPVOs on some of my SBRs, my 16-inch guns, whatever. That's just me personally. I like the magnification. I like the clarity. But now you have added weight. You have added expense. You have battery life that kind of sucks on some of the battery uh, life that have the high bright models, with the exception of like the Trigicon TR24, which uses the fiber optics, which is still one of my favorite LPVOs. Uh, but there's trade-offs, right? There's no free lunch. So, But if I had to pick just one, like if I had to pick one rifle with one optic for the rest of my life to do everything with, it would be a rifle with an LPVO. That's just the way it would be. So. Good question. Really good question. Maybe we can elaborate more into that on like a range video and kind of go over the pros and cons. So uh, I love that kind of stuff. And if you guys can also answer in the comment section uh, below. Uh, and yeah, with a, uh, a top dot. Yeah. Well, now he said one optic. He didn't allow me to add that, but I would clarify if I could have an offset optic uh, like the Arasaka mount that I did. A, I did that video a long time ago where I had an offset 45. Um, I like having that offset 45 or you could put it with the top dot like uh, range range dead inside is posting here. So absolutely. All right. That's a good question. Uh, another comment from Matthew. What is the main difference between Loctite 242 and 243 and what's better for red dot screws on handguns? I'm so happy you asked because I literally, I run 243 on my bench. Can you see that? Is it focused? Got to have it block my face because the camera looks for my face. Loctite 243. Uh, if we look at the tech specs, and Kevin, you are uh, appreciative of the tech specs. He likes it when I talk about technical data, uh, the engineer. Um, I like 243 better. The difference is 242 is medium strength thread locker. Although if you read the tech data sheet, it's technically for fasteners over a quarter inch in diameter, which is too much for handgun red dot screws. Okay, 243 is also for those same diameter screws, medium strength. However, 243 is oil resistant, meaning that if you didn't degrease your screws or the receptacles perfect and you still had some oil and crud, the 243 would have a better chance of bonding through that oil because the oil basically acts as a barrier or a release agent preventing the super glue, for lack of a better term, but kind of what it is, from sticking the metal together, right? We're gluing the screw in place. So the 242... Uh, isn't as oil resistant. So if you're going to buy one, just buy the 243. I buy it in these bigger containers because truth be told, they're not that much more than the little containers. And I go through a lot when I'm teaching classes, setting up guns for agencies, students, whoever. Uh, now on pistol red dots, I still use 243, even though it is too strong. Uh, technically we're supposed to use 222, which is, no, oh. Any, uh, I can't reach it. 222 is purple, and that's designed for fasteners under a uh, quarter inch. However, I've had issues where that will break loose from that reciprocating mass. So here's a couple of tricks. I'm, I'm kind of getting off tangent a little bit because uh, this isn't exactly your question. But if you're putting blue on handgun screws, which are number six screws, like 632, uh, metric three, metric four, small diameter screws, okay? If you don't have a good quality fastener, uh, like a good quality high tensile strength screw, and a good quality tool, like good quality bits, longer tools like the Wura 
uh, bits are some of my favorites. Uh, you have the likelihood of stripping out screws because if you have a cheap screw that is glued in place with soft, crappy metal and you have a crappy uh, tool, it's going to strip out the head of that screw because that screw is held in with more strength than that metal can really handle. Whereas if you use a good quality screw with a high tensile strength, a good quality metal, uh, you can then engage that tool into that screw and with steady pressure, you can break that glue bond of the higher strength thread locker. Because again, even though this is medium strength, it technically is too much for the uh, smaller diameter screws. That's why there's different strengths, right? Because we can hold different things. So hopefully that makes sense. I, I've kind of gone a little off into the weeds on there, but I love talking about thread locker and torque and tensile strength and shear strength. Uh, in my armors section of my red dot classes, I talk about this. And to my knowledge, I'm one of either the only one or one of very few who nerds out as much when it comes to optic installation. Like a lot of classes will just say, guys, make sure you torque and use thread locker. But, um, oh, I'm freezing up a little bit. Uh, I try to prioritize um, that part of it. So hopefully we're still coming through. Uh, let me make sure I'm prioritizing my device here quick. Give me one sec. Go to my Wi-Fi settings because uh, it's, it's buggy on my end. So hopefully it's not buggy on your end. Leave a comment if it is. And we'll see here. Uh, but anyways, uh, that is kind of, you know, what's going on with uh, thread locker and torque and, and all that stuff. Uh, my kids are home, so it's summer school and all that. So now we have the joys of um, me having to compete with internet, you know, for all that stuff. So uh, let me make sure I'm still prioritized and I have good internet connection. Uh, leave me a comment. If, uh, if you guys can still hear me okay. I'm not even sure if I'm getting comments, I guess. So, okay, still sounds good. Audio good, video choppy, yeah. All right, I'm going to try to prioritize my device here uh, for internet traffic, or I might just turn off my devices for my kids. Maybe I should do that. Well, hopefully you guys can still hear me. It is a podcast after all, and uh, we'll see, see what happens, right? We'll see if I get the internet back. But otherwise, uh, I'm going to have to kick my kids out, which... <laughs> Good luck with that, right? I don't know how you guys are dealing with it. Summer people work from home, summer kids, all that stuff. So anyways, I'll try to do my best. We'll, we'll treat this as an audio only podcast if the video is going to be choppy and, uh, you know, we'll just kind of go from there. So, uh, where were we for comments? Suggestions for a five, five, six and 300 blackout carbon fiber barrel manufacturers. Uh, I, you know, obviously everybody talks about proof, but the barrels that I just got in for review are from BSF. Uh, I believe it's BSF. Yeah, BSF. And they look really good. I have not shot them yet. I got to get them built into a gun, but um, they look really good quality and they're doing some unique stuff where they're sleeving it. Uh, there's another uh, carbon fiber company called Helix 6. And they, what's interesting about them is that you can still shorten those barrels because they use a different type. Now, a lot of carbon fiber companies out there will have a steel barrel with like a, basically a channel uh, cutout, if you will. And then they'll add a sleeve of carbon fiber, whereas Helix 6 is doing it a little bit differently uh, so that you can still shorten those barrels as needed. So uh, Helix 6, BSF, those would be ones that I would definitely look at. And BSF, the AR ones looked really good. I can't wait to get them in a gun and start shooting them. Uh, this one is from DeGrawl. I did receive my platypus. Oh my gosh, this is awesome. All right, so uh, loved it, used it in IDPA in a MSP holster, had uh, down zero on the 35 target range, trigger does not feel like four pounds. So is that like, does it mean it feels heavier or lighter? Because at the show, the platypus, man, I think it packed above its price point. I, uh, I got to say, it was, it impressed me. I ordered a platypus. It's not here yet. I don't know how long I'll have to wait for it, but uh, I am excited. Definitely really, really excited to get my hands on a platypus. I think that's a cool gun. And say what you will, guys, about, you know, the platypus, whether it is a, um, you know, 1911 or not. Like, some of the comments that I've seen on that were like, that's not a 1911. Well, why not? Just because it takes a different magazine? Like, is that the only criteria that makes a 1911 a 1911 is the magazine that it takes? Because I, I don't think that's true. Uh, but... I look at it as, does it have a straight back trigger press with a trigger bow? Does it use 1911 fire control group? You know, like the sear, disconnector, hammer. Is it single action? Those are all things that I kind of define. Like the one that I struggle with is, is a DWX a 1911 platform gun? Because it doesn't have a grip safety, but it utilizes a lot of other 1911-esque parts. So is the, is the 1911 a cover a DWX or not? But 
Uh, I want to hear more about your platypus though. So that, uh, that's really cool. Uh, this one is, hey, Trevor, thanks for tuning in. Appreciate it. Good to see you. Uh, let's go. We're going to try, right? Hopefully my internet keeps up and we'll go from there. Uh, yeah. So according to my internet speed, I have enough, but the video, like I'm looking at it on my screen and it looks choppy. So I, I, I apologize guys. Um, yeah. I don't know. Use high quality video mode. It's trying. So we'll see. Uh, does body armor plates really expire after the date? Um, basically why they do that is because they take into account environmental conditions and humidity, temperature, all that stuff can break down some of those bonds. However, I've shot some really, really old body armor and it held up just fine. But what they take into account with expiration date is use. And I can't remember what the formula is for hard plates versus soft body armor. But for soft body armor, for example, there's a formula of uh, average daily use that they take into account. And with soft body armor that's worn against you with the heat, the sweat, the moisture, all that stuff, it can break down those things. And that's why they give it an expiration date of five years for most soft body armor. Uh, obviously that formula is less for hard armor. I'd have to do some double checking on what the manufacturers are. So, uh, that is, that is that, uh, from Matthew, uh, do I need to use, let's see here. Thank you. Do I need to use the 243 as a filler as I was watching the shadow systems and they said to use it as a filler once you have mounted the optic? Yes. So what I do teach is I do teach using the 243 to bed the screws. So at the top of the screw, we have a taper and I will put a little dab of 243 on that taper of the screw and then that meets the taper of the optic body and it kind of beds that screw into place. It prevents gunk and crap from getting down into the threads and it will as another little uh, area of... Um, Adhesion, plus then in the void of the optic body where the screw just passes through, that 243 can kind of fill in and act as a bedding compound and make a, a pillar. I think I had a video that covered some of that. I think that's in my red dot mounting video, my most recent one, that kind of talks about making those pillars with that 243. So, But I, I use 243 and I, I don't have any issues. But again, I don't use cheap screws and I don't use um, cheap tools. So that is very, very important. Um, Let's see here. Still freezing. I know, man. I know. I don't know what the deal is. I don't know if I should pause the stream and try to reconnect, uh, but I, I just want to want to keep going. At least we have audio, right? Uh, from DeGraw, it feels lighter. Well, that's good. That's a properly tuned 1911 trigger. Even on the gauge, it might say four pounds. It can feel lighter because a 1911, 2011 trigger is a two-stage trigger. And if we can put the majority of the weight in that first stage and then have that remaining breaking stage lighter, it can actually feel a lot light, light, lighter. Uh, this is from Philip, the best caliber for CCW. I know you mean caliber, no big deal. Uh, nine millimeter. It's cheap. It's dependable. You can get good capacity. There's a lot of good loads for self-defense. Nine millimeter for sure all day, every day. Best caliber, nine millimeter. It's easy to find, easy to train with, all that stuff. Hey, Josh, good to see you, man. Welcome to the stream. How is the internet for you? Uh, I believe you're hailing from California. Um, the internet here in Minnesota is apparently sucking today because uh, it is nothing but nothing but crap here. So let me just try changing the uh, the quality just for a second here. I don't know if it's going to make a difference or not, but um, we'll see. Oh, now, but Dustin carries a 50 Action Express for his, uh, EDC. So, you know, good for you, man. That, that it takes a, it takes a big man to a uh, big man to do that. Uh, from Josh, who is our hollow sun rep. Uh, he was on the live stream by the way. Oh man. How long ago was that? Two, three months ago. Was it, I believe it was after NRA, uh, that we did a live interview with him. He was my first guest, but, uh, yes, the 507 comp man, I am digging it. I got it on a staccato. Um, I will have that video coming out shortly. Let's get the camera to focus. Where'd it go? Come on, any there it is. The 507 Comp. This is their new competition focused optic. It has a really big window um, and it's an RMR footprint. Obviously, they're going after, you know, like the other popular competition optics, the Delta Point, the SRO, things like that. And this thing is great. It has the multi reticle system, which I'll show some behind the camera footage with it. Uh, it uh, yeah, it's pretty cool how you can select the different sizes. Now, I was also thinking too, like, I don't know if you're going to put this technology into like some of the other optics, but like, I was even thinking like this in a normal 508 would be really cool, especially if you put it on like a shotgun, because obviously some shotguns are going to pattern a little bit differently. And if you could, um, if you could, 
change the ring size to meet your your buckshot pattern out to like 25 yards, for example, uh, and having that multiply reticle system uh, in a 508 size optic, that'd be kind of cool too. So, uh, but I'll show you guys some behind the camera footage with the 507 comp, just to kind of show what it looks like on like an eight inch plate. I think I walked it back to about 25 yards. Same thing with a, a Ipsic size target as well. So yeah, definitely, uh, definitely pretty cool stuff here. All right. Uh, just for fun, I'm going to quit the other computer for a sec and I'm going to change settings to, uh, I turned off the high quality video mode here for just a second and we'll see if that makes any difference with uh, streaming quality. I don't know if it will or not. It's just, it, uh, man, it just kind of sucks today. What's, what's going on with, um, the video quality, but yeah, Josh says we're only getting roughly 10 frames a second. So there's definitely something going on. I, I don't know if it's an internet thing or what, because according to my internet speed, I just tested it. Uh, I have like 900 meg download speed and I prioritized this device. So this is the joys of live streaming. Uh, it's just, it goes crappy sometimes. So thankfully, uh, we are, you know, we record the audio and we push out the audio, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, whoever said 50, a yeah, wrist health, exactly. Dustin, uh, I could make so many jokes. I can make so many jokes, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to. All right. Uh, this is back from Matthew. Uh, I'll do a calculate. I have a calculated kinetics optic plate, but I'm going to use the SRO screws that came with it, I think. Uh, can you link that video? When I'm done, uh, it will be like how to mount a red dot and how to zero it. Uh, I'll try to remember to put that in there. Otherwise, if you search on the channel, you should be able to find it. But yeah, for sure. I can totally do that. And I haven't check, uh, checked out the calculated kinetics optics plates yet, but I've heard good things. So uh, Bob says the audio is perfect. Good to hear. Had a Masterpiece Arms come into my shop. Really? That is a pretty cool gun. Uh, I know that uh, their Smith, that Masterpiece Arms hired, and they worked with uh, Chili, I believe, because I think they're using Chili grips. They used uh, Chili for like a consultant on that product development, if you will. So I would love to check out a, a Masterpiece Arms gun in person. Uh, I'm really, uh, I can't wait for the Voodoo to get here. I, if there was one gun that I'm excited about checking out, obviously it was my Nighthawk. I, I like um, Nighthawk stuff a lot. And then I can't wait to get uh, the Voodoo in. I mean, it's, it's a good year right now to be in the 2011, 1911 double stack game. Like we have some really good options out on the market. Uh, also, what makes some of the determining factors to contribute price fluctuate, fluc, fluctuation? No, oh, man, I cannot talk today. Uh, fluxating price. Let's we'll go with that on different calibers, other than availability. Uh, right now, it's a big thing is materials and demand, supply demand. Right as supply is less, demand is high. Prices will go up as materials go up. Lead, copper, brass. Uh, the materials that go into the primer compounds, all that other stuff, it definitely determines what it is. So for example, when demand for everything else is super high, 22 rimfire goes up because they're not going to allocate resources to make rimfire ammunition. You know, so there's all sorts of stuff that goes on in the industry uh, with, with that. So yeah, audio is fine. And that's the most important thing. That's good. I'm glad. Uh, is it even? No, exactly. Exactly. This is what I'm talking about. See, Josh gets it. Is it even a live stream if you don't have a tech issue? And I feel like that is exactly what happens every dang time I try to live stream. It's always some sort of tech issue. And I cannot figure out for the life of me why this is this is uh, going here. So uh, I have, yeah, I, I don't know. I have the required, you know, internet speed. I have the high quality film mode off. I'm turning it back on. I'm trying to update um, the different settings. And uh, yeah, it, it looks looks crappy. So, uh, and do I need to add Loctite to screws that come with the factory? Yes. Yes. Get rid of that garbage. It's usually a, a temporary form. I'm not going to say the name cause I don't want to get bashed or whatever, but the reality is, um, why are my comments boxes? Let's, uh, there we go. Um, for sure. You need to add Loctite. I use 243. Like I said, I take off all the crap that's applied from the factory and I put on my own stuff. Uh, what pens do I use for witness marks? I use the Sharpie oil-based paint markers and I have a whole jar of different colors and sizes and things like that. Uh, but uh, for me, I have a color code system that for screws with blue thread locker, I use blue. For screws with red thread locker, I use red. Uh, and since I have not found a purple oil-based paint marker, I use white. Um, 
for that because they make the white or maybe you could use a yellow or something but I do have a white fine based paint marker around here yeah the white is what I'll use uh, for light strength thread locking compound so uh, I carry red white and blue in my range bag and in my toolkit and then I also carry it um, uh, in the you know in the shop here as well for witness marks but sharpie oil based paint markers are the key because otherwise the water based ones come off in the uh, in the sand so uh, yeah, I'll use pen. I've made many mistakes. Yeah. Uh, I even have some videos on witness marks and stuff too, which, uh, I'll try to remember to link below, but, uh, you can definitely check out those, but Sharpie oil-based paint markers for the win. All right. Let me quick check in with email questions because I do have to give a shout out to all of our patron supporters. And again, I do appreciate all of those that send in, uh, emails. And unfortunately we're getting some, spam as the channel is growing you know we definitely get a lot more spam as far as like we want to sponsor you we're a video game company from china and blah 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 so it it is what it is right but uh let's go back to june here real quick uh this one is from uh i don't know how to pronounce it is it vanha I don't know. Just watched your LPVO video. Curious on your thoughts on the Night Force Attacker 1 to 8. How does it compare to the Voodoo or the Vortex? Uh, honestly, the Attacker is a great, great LPVO. Uh, Daylight Bright, the reticle is really well designed. Uh, it's a big, beefy optic with good glass. I would say, arguably, it's uh, the Attacker line of Night Force is some of their best optics yet. I don't own one. I had a Night Force uh, NX8, and I actually sold that, I believe, to get the Vortex 1 to 10. But I would love to get a uh, one to eight and attack our one to eight from night force. I think that's a great scope. Like I said, good options. Um, I like the reticle a little bit better in the voodoo. Uh, I'm sorry, in the vortex, the voodoo reticle was cool too, but the ring was a little too big for what I wanted it for. Um, but the, uh, attacker is an awesome, awesome scope, awesome reticle as well. I just like the vortex a little bit more, which is why I'm sticking with that for now, but I'll probably pick up a night force at some point. Uh, this one's from Kevin. Uh, what are the rules of thumb for effective and lethal ranges backstop for law enforcement, self-defense shotgun using federal flight control? Uh, well, I think obviously the biggest rule of thumb is to pattern a shotgun with your particular, uh, you know, ammunition choice. And obviously then you'd have to figure out then where can I account for all of my pellets and for federal flight control with most good quality shotguns, that's going to be around 25 yards. After that, we start to have pellets leave our silhouette and therefore that's not optimal because once pellets are leaving that zone, we're not responsible uh, or we're not maintaining responsibility for that. So I would definitely found, um, definitely make sure that is something, uh, you know, to keep in mind with, with patterning as well. Uh, effective and lethal ranges for slugs in the same shotgun. Again, pattern it, see where your accuracy is acceptable. Most agencies will shoot out to 50 yards. Some will shoot out to 100 yards for qualifications with slugs. And again, it depends on the quality of equipment, the skill level, things like that. Uh, in the classes I taught, it seems like the effective range for 35 with flight control. Yep, very well could be. Uh, maybe 15 to 25 yards for average. Um, and yes, should, should be aware of their backstop. Absolutely. Uh, what is a good way to teach skip shooting? Uh, you don't. Okay. That's just generally not something in domestic LE that we, I know there's some videos out there. I know there's some people who talk about like shooting under cars and all that other stuff. Um, but dudes, I would challenge you with this. Uh, if you can find me one or two officer involved shooting videos where they did that, I would love to study those more because I just, you don't see it happen in real world scenarios very often. Now I get combat situations, Iraq or whatever, but I'm talking domestic US. That's what I'm talking about. That's my that's my lane, so that's what I stay with. So uh, as far as effective ways, because there are variables, I know people have talked about like hoods and all that. And I think there is some merit when it comes to vehicles, but other scenarios, I think it's a much more limited thing. So I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that for now. Uh, let me hop back to emails here quick. Um, any good ways to teach shooting through windshields, things like that? Again, go to a good quality vehicle class. I think arguably the, the best vehicle class out there right now is uh, Will Petty Centrifuge, uh, his vehicle CQB class. He does a lot of that. Uh, we did some stuff with the company that I trained for with 88. Uh, we do some stuff with contract, but right now Will Petty is pretty much the main, main, main dude when it comes to vehicle stuff. So he does a lot of ballistics lab type stuff. Um, yeah. Is there any heart-to-heart -heart discussions that can happen to get people or cops to stop taking bench grinders, pliers, Dremel tools? Uh, dude, it happens with everybody. It's not just with cops. I see so many guns that come in with a bag of gun or whatever, Dremel tools, that kind of thing, that it can be 
it can be a handful with whatever. Uh, email question from uh, Quentin. Uh, do you think using a handgun red dot can lock in bad shooting habits? Absolutely not. If anything, a handgun red dot will lock in good habits because you see everything that you do with the gun. Uh, in my classes, I teach that the dot is an information sensor and it is all of that. So if anything, if you get good habits with a red dot, you'll have better habits with iron sights because with iron sights, you don't know your bad habits. You don't know how much the gun is really moving. You don't know how much of a jerk you really had. Whereas the dot, the dot's shaking. You see the dot dip, dot all the way. Dot will lock in good habits and make better habits. I can't stress that enough. Uh, let me go back to our live. And it looks like, again, our video quality is still garbage. So I, I apologize for that. Uh, a lot of gun tubers recommend SDI for people. Um, here's the deal, man. I'm going to be upfront with you. Uh, I know some people that have taken classes through SDI, and when I looked at their curriculum and their final exam, which is basically just to build an AR, um, yeah, here's the deal. Uh, and I don't expect SDI to come around and be an advertiser anytime soon because I'm probably going to say this, but uh, SDI pays a lot of money to advertise on a lot of outlets, okay? I, do I think it's the best place to go for an online gunsmithing school? Uh, I don't know of, of all of the different options out there, but again, when I've talked to people who have attended Sonoran, uh, and when I hear like, oh, your final exam was to build an AR, okay? Like, I've gone to a lot of armorers classes and things like that where we've gotten way more into the weeds than it sounded like what they've covered. But I haven't taken it, so I don't want to speak with firsthand experience, but I will say this, they pay a lot of money to advertise their program and, and all that other stuff out there, so... I think if you wanted to get into it, find some good quality armorers classes, try to apprentice under a gunsmith, a good one, um, maybe take some basic machining classes, things like that at the community ed level. Uh, those would be areas that I would look at uh, because you can get more, more, more information than what you're, what you're looking for. Uh, so I found one of your older videos. No, there is a newer one. It was not a staccato. It was like two or three years ago. I updated it. Um, that one, I think I had an old shield site on. So it wasn't the six year ago one. It was, there's, there's one that I did updated with that. Uh, Art, good to have you live, man. I uh, apologize for the video question. Um, I know the, the video is, is sucking today right now, but, uh, you know, at least we have audio. At least you guys can listen. And let's face it, you don't come here for my pretty face anyway, right, guys? So that's what it is. Uh, this is a question for Josh. Josh, if you're still tuning in, how do you achieve multiple reticle options on a single red dot? Is there multiple emitters? Is there apertures? Or is there a special voodoo magic underneath the hood that we can't see somewhere? And Dustin, I added a little bit of artistic license to your question. So once Josh replies, I'll post that comment up here as well. So Josh, if you're still watching, how do you get those multiple reticles with a single emitter, uh, i.e. the halo, the dot, the different sizes? Is it is it like an aperture system? Is it, you know, uh, that's pretty cool. That's a really good question. Really good question. Uh, green versus red, small, large, blah, blah, blah. Um, I like red overall. I do have some greens. Overall, I think... I don't know. I, I, I keep going back to red, even though I try green. Um, but some people really like green better. If you have a certain colorblind, uh, you know, amber is going to be the new one that's coming out. I'm not supposed to, uh, I might not have supposed to talk about that. Sorry, Josh. But anyways, um, some people see red better. Some people see green better. Some people see red crisper. Some people see green crisper, contrast, whatever. So some people have said, I find green brighter. I find red brighter. Uh, your eyes react really well to red and green, right? There's a reason why the military picked green as kind of their night vision color. There's a, uh, you know, it's just a natural color that happens, right? Uh, generally speaking, though, I will prefer red overall because it's available, it's constant, whatever, but that's just what I like. I like about a two to three MOA dot size. That's kind of my sweet spot. I've used bigger dots. I've used smaller dots and my personal preference. And again, this is just my opinion. I like that two to three MOA size for a pistol red dot. I can be precise at distance. I, it's quick up close. Um, but the reality is even if we're using a six MOA dot, like everyone's like, oh, that's so huge. It covers up so much of the target. Dude, that's six inches at 100 yards. And at 15 yards, it's less than that. Way like an inch, right? And But people say it covers up so much. Come on, let's be honest here. Let's be realistic, right? Uh, SDI is expensive for what you get. Exactly. It seems like competition world has a major influence on what industry. Yeah, uh, because competition dudes are the ones who spend money, right? And they're the shooters. Like there's some high level competition shooters out there where technology trickles from. Handgun red dots, for example. That is a technology that we stole from competition shooters. Now that we have it in military, law enforcement, defense, or whatever, competition shooters were shooting red dots on their handguns 30 years ago. Legit 30 years ago. So there's definitely, um, definitely, 
competition tricks that definitely lead that because they are the shooters and they do influence a lot. And that's what, in some ways, I'm kind of going to get on a soapbox here. That's what, in some ways, pisses me off with some of the tactical or the LE instructors out there who refuse to learn from competition shooters. They're like, I can't learn anything from those gamers. There's, it's not a two-way range and blah, blah, blah. Like I had one cop in a class and I was like, we're talking about competition shooters, what we can learn from competition shooters. And then he pouts back, but there's nobody shooting back. And I really wanted to say, okay, how many shootings have you been in? Uh, by the way, it was zero. Um, and I haven't, you know, I'm not a ninja gunfighter either. So, but I look at dudes who can shoot better than me, who can shoot faster than me, who can shoot more efficient and proficient for me. And you're telling me that I don't want to learn from them. That just doesn't make any sense to me. So I want to learn from competition shoot shooters. I have things that I can learn from competition shooters. And why wouldn't I want to learn? And I should be smart enough to apply critical thought to figuring out that's a really good gaming tactic. This would be how I would apply that on the street or in a defense situation or whatever. So I, it just blows my mind how some people are so close-minded to not learning from competition shooters. Now, there are some techniques that I would never do in the street. So like competition shooters will do, uh, I think some people call it a flamingo where they kind of like stand on one foot, take a shot, and then they come back down. That's not going to happen on the street, right? But it's a competition tactic. So uh, all that. But um, other, what's next? That's your question. Sorry, I get off on these tangents, guys. Um, what's next, I would say, is probably uh, evolving technology for recoil control. I think we're going to start to see some more comp stuff, make it more mainstream. We're going to see more uh, str uh, spring tuning, things like that. And the fact that SIG, with their AXG Legion, got compensators, um, in legal and whatever class that is, I think some of that's going to be the trend. And I think it's just going to be to make a softer, more flat shooting pistol. So I, I really think those are the things that are coming. Uh, also is bufferless AR the way to go? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's cool. It, you can fold the stock or, you know, all that other stuff, but you know, it is, uh, it, it's still nice to have a traditional stock. Okay, here we go. Um, let's see here. Oh, this is from Josh. Is there an overemphasis in the industry put on for training scenarios that are unlikely? Yeah, exactly. Uh, versus just training how to shoot better overall with dry fire, the basics. I, I think so. I think a lot of people, oh my gosh, you're going to get me on, on another soapbox here, Josh. Uh, I've had a few groups reach out. Uh, I do training. I'm not trying to plug that here, but I, I do some training. I've been traveling around the country doing LE stuff and I do some open enrollment classes, whatever. And I had uh, some groups reach out saying like, we don't want the basics. We don't want the fundamentals. We want advanced training. And then you get there and they can't hit the broadside of the target after 10 yards. So they want the advanced stuff, movement, cover, all this other stuff, but they don't even have the basics down. And I truly think that most people are better served when you have a solid fundamental core understanding of the essential skills required to effectively manipulate a pistol, rifle, whatever. And then we can work on the other stuff because there's no sense in working on movement when you can't even hit the target standing still, right? Or there's no sense in working on cover when you can't even shoot the target under a controlled flat range environment very well, right? Or speed or efficiency or all that. So I do think there is some overemphasis on some of this stuff. Certain people, yep, yeah, totally get it then it's okay to take a more in-depth look at training for different skill sets, right? But the core skill set needs to be fundamentals and efficiencies and proficiency with your daily carry equipment of choice. And, you know, when I teach LE, I wear LE stuff. When I teach open enrollment, I'll generally wear more of an inside the waistband or an appendix rig or whatever, or I'll teach an outside rig just so I can demo stuff a little bit. But I don't, I used to be the guy who would show up with a separate training belt that was completely different from my daily carry. And then I had an instructor, a mentor, Dave Spaulding say, are you on the SWAT team? And I was like, nope, this is my training rig. Well, why don't you set up your training rig like your daily rig? And I was just like, that makes, yeah, I, this is fantasy band camp for me if I'm not doing that. So I set up a training rig, exact same duty holster, level three, all that other stuff. Uh, and the only reason why I don't wear my duty rig, and sometimes I would, is that uh, for me, it was a business issue. Like my department had a policy. I can't use department stuff for external business expenses or whatever. And plus with the basket weave and all that, I didn't necessarily want it to get all scuffed up rolling around on the ground. So I'd have a nylon rig that was the exact mirrored chain or same of that, but level three, duty belt, all that stuff. And I train like I play. That's how I try to do it. So uh, when I teach LE, I still run a level three holster, even though a lot of the LE now are running level one, level two, all that stuff. Uh, so, uh, five MOA, yeah, it'll be fine. My man, five MOA is just, is just fine. You don't worry about it. Um, uh, competitions like IDPA, USBA, I treat them like real life. Yep. 
yeah, you want to be accountable for your rounds looking at it? Absolutely. Crystal ball, I think the speed thumb lens. Yeah, you know what, holster. Uh, I agree with you. Recoil mitigation, yep. Uh, the thumb things, they don't necessarily do it for much as me because my thumb is generally more of a floating high thumb, but I think you are right. I think we are going to see some of that, and then we just got to get holsters that fit. All right, Dustin, Josh is tuned in. The MRS question. We use a complex LED system where you can cut the LED to be the exact shape. Really? That is cool. That's really cool. With this system, we can put 100% of the energy into the exact parts of the reticle we want. I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. Huh. Now, so Josh, to follow up on that, do different parts of the LED illuminate to get the ring versus the dot? Or is it multiple LEDs, like layers, like an onion? Does that make sense? Um I'd be curious about that. That's really cool, man. I didn't know you could cut the LED to be the exact shape. That's that's pretty neat. So, uh, all right, we're caught up on comments. Let me check up on emails. And let me also give a quick shout out to Global Ordnance. Global Ordnance is your one-stop shop for all things ammunition related. They have it all. Plus, they are the importer of some cool firearms, which I will have some videos coming out on. But I appreciate their support. If you use the code in the description, you're going to get free shipping on orders over 200, which will cover all your cases, things like that. So yes, you can order multiple cases and get free shipping with the code that will be in the description below. Global Ordnance has all the calibers that you know and love for training, competition, practice, whatever it might be. They have the staples at pretty good prices too for bulk stuff. Plus they're importing and exporting their own stuff. Some of their steel cased ammunition is budget friendly and it is the nicest steel ammunition I've ever seen. It's like polished. When I first saw it, I could have swore it was nickel plated because it looked so good and it shoots really good. I'll have some more upcoming videos and some of that too, but I do appreciate Global Ordnance support of the channel. Plus they're providing the prize to one lucky question asker at the show. So Definitely appreciate Global Ordnance. I can't stress enough how it is awesome to have Global Ordnance as a partner and sponsor of the show. You can check them out, Global Ordnance Online. I can't say their direct thing because, you know, violations of social media, all that stuff. But check out Global Ordnance. Use the coupon code that will be in the description, which is uh, listed below. <laughs> I hit the wrong button. There we go. Uh, you can obviously get free shipping, like I said, and they're going to be providing the prize. So super cool to have them. All right, let's check back in with email questions. Let's see. Uh, this is a 2011 question from Daniel uh, from New Jersey, currently running a SIG and has a DPP. Uh, it's difficult to get handguns, all that stuff. I love, love the CZ Shadow too, but eventually opted for a SIG. I love it, but I'm really itching for an upgrade, Staccato P or the Shadow 2. I have a CZ uh, TS2, which I love, but I think I would probably get a Staccato P uh, and a CZ eventually. But a Staccato P is just going to do so much for you. A steel frame Staccato P is awesome. They shoot really, really well. I would, man, I think you'd be just fine with a Staccato P. I think you'd love it, actually. So that's what I would probably go with there. Uh, another email question. This one is uh, from Paul. This is a Staccato C2 question. Uh, Thank you for the wealth of knowledge. Live in the Philippines. Finally able to purchase. My questions are trigger reach, mag release method. Uh, I was wondering if there's a way to change. Yes, you can change it to a, a short, flat trigger. It'd probably be a gunsmith thing because you have to get the trigger taken out. And then you have this little trigger part, which I think I can show parts on camera. Uh, but it's, and it's not focusing anyway. But um, this is the part, and you would take it out, and the shoe would actually be shorter. So then that would adjust that. So you can totally get that in there. And then the mag release method. Uh, some guys will shift their grip to manipulate the mag release, which I have to a little bit. Other guys will come back with their support hand and hit it. Either one is fine. Uh, and then you can obviously do your thing. So that's the mag release methods. I think I did that a little bit in my 2011 new shooter guide, which you should um, check that out. So yes, you would have to ship, shift the grip. Uh, or you could use the support. So either one is fine. It's just whatever you practice, right? But practice both because what happens if you're doing something one-handed, you'll probably have to practice shifting that grip a little bit. So that's what I do is I shift my grip slightly and then I kind of readjust and then uh, I come up with my support hand and either hit the slide stop or I hit the front serrations. Those are my, uh, those are my methods. Uh, this one is from Kevin again. Uh, this was a, oh, this was a comment. Um, what are some things to do when somebody has a brain damage, a TBI, and they really should prevent them from having a firearm? No legal issues as far as, I'm assuming you mean they're not criminally in violation, you know, restraining orders or stuff like that. Uh, now, 
you say that local law enforcement cannot be trusted to do the right thing, unethical, blah, blah, you know, all that stuff. Uh, I, I don't know what your experiences are with local LE or whatever, but it, it sounds like you definitely have some bad experiences, which I'm not taking away anything of yours. But law, local law enforcement also has to be careful that they can't violate people's rights. And there's plenty of examples of cops violating people's rights, and then they get sued, they get fired, they get jailed, they get all that, whatever. So generally speaking, if a cop doesn't have the legal authority to take somebody's gun, they might not be able to. And that's where the courts and the family have to get involved, basically having a civil, some sort of civil court order saying that they are no longer competent, it's no longer safe or whatever. And then that starts a whole other order of red flag laws, restraining orders, all that stuff. Because that's a conversation that not a lot of people like to have because red flag laws they could be abused. People have filed false orders. What if it's a, a difference of opinion? So that's probably a way more complex issue than we can get in on a live stream. Uh, but it is something that a lot of people probably don't think about as much, right? And I know for me, I've had that thought too, where, man, when I get older, what am I going to do with my firearms collection? And the reality is as I get older and I'm probably maybe physically not able to shoot as much, but I'm still mentally intact, I'll probably start selling and downgrading. Uh, and then converting that to a different asset that I can maybe pass on uh, to my heirs? Or do I have somebody in my life that I care about who values it and I would pass them on to them at that point or whatever and maybe only keep a couple of things or whatever? Because I definitely don't want to be a burden uh, to my to my heirs or whatever. So, uh, all right. That's uh, some good questions there. Let's... Let's uh, let's see here. All right, art. LARPing has its place because uh, I'm not an operator who operates operationally. That's right. Do you have a patch? Do you want one of those operator patches, Art? Send me a message. I'll get you a patch, uh, an operator patch. Uh, if you're not training, you're not. Yeah, exactly. All right, uh, Art. This is for Josh here. Uh, are you with Holosun? Yes. Uh, he is um, He is the Holosun rep. He was actually on our live stream uh, a few months ago, and uh, he does a lot. He's their marketing you know, I don't know what your official title is, Josh, but he does work for Holosun. He's been wanting to connect with your team to offer classes. So uh, firearms training associate. Oh, FTA. Um, Art, are, do you, you guys handle like instructor insurance and all that stuff too, right? That's you? You're with FTA? I did not know that. Shoot. Hey, Art, will you send me an email? I'd like to connect. I do have to renew my instructor certification insurance and all that stuff here soon. So, um, have you heard of quality issues with PTs, uh, locking blocks, and have I tried out the Combat Precision M5? No, I, okay, if you can put in a good word for me with Combat Precision and have them send me a demo M5, I would love it. Uh, but I've seen their stuff, I have not seen one in person, and I don't even know if they're in stock, I think they might be behind, but it looks pretty cool, I'll give it that, but I don't know what they have going on under the hood. Now, as far as the, with the Phoenix Trinity, uh, with their locking block, for those of you guys that don't know, the Phoenix Trinity does not use a traditional barrel link that uses a locking block. And I showed that in my TriggerCon video from last year where they showed their barrel and it kind of basically has more of a traditional um, block and locking design. Oh, that could be awkward depending on... Good thing the title is covering up what I was doing with my hands. But has there been some issues of that locking block uh, having issues? So they recommend to keep it really well lubricated. I know some guys will run a light grease on it. The only dudes that I've heard have had issues with their Phoenix Trinity locking blocks are competition shooters who are shooting literally tens of thousands of rounds. And I've only heard of a couple people having issues. Otherwise, the majority of other people have not keep it well lubed. Uh, but I do really want to check out a PT. Uh, I want to get a demo H duty, H tac kind of hybrid that I can kind of run and kind of see if the hype is all worth it because they, um, you know, obviously making high-end guns, their CNC, their machining tolerances, all that stuff is super high-end. And I definitely want to get a Phoenix Trinity to check out on my own because I know they've sent out some demo guns. I met their marketing guy at a recent media event, so I'm hoping to connect and reach out, but it will be cool. I'm looking better to kind of have a comparison video comparing Staccato, Nighthawk, Voodoo, uh, Atlas, Phoenix Trinity, uh, the Platypus, you know, Stealth Arms, all that kind of stuff. Maybe an M5, you know, but I, I like collecting 2011s. It's just... Um, more money, more problems, right? I need more of you guys to drop some super thanks and everything else to get in there. Uh, for everybody else to see, uh, Josh says, think of the LED like a light bright board. We have the LED plugged in to, we make the MRS pattern and then we activate them as we need it. That is really cool. That is just cool. Uh, that's a great explanation of it. I agree, Dustin. Uh, Dustin posted as a great explanation, but that is just really cool how you light different parts of the light bright board to make the different reticles. So that's pretty awesome. I think that's uh, that's really cool. Uh, yeah, and, you know, Chris started the purge. Well, if you're selling any 2011s, let me know. And, yes, Josh is with that. All right. Uh, let's see. I live in a country. Where are you from, uh, Philip? What country are you from? 
Uh, I live in a country with barely any gun restrictions just because it's the third poorest nation in the world. Really? Uh, so many people. There's like three dudes with ARs. What country is that? I'm, I'm just uh, curious on what it is. Um, and it's insanely expensive to import stuff. Absolutely. Uh, Vibratite versus Loctite. Uh, Permatex, Vibratite, Loctite, they all are thread adhesives, right? Generally speaking, I've tried them all. I have the best luck. Me, I, my opinion, I have the best luck with Loctite brand. I've tried Vibratite, uh, VC3, not the biggest fan. Some of the other Vibratite stuff, they're traditional thread lockers, blues, purples, whatever, reds, it's fine. Permatex makes good quality stuff as well. Permatex actually has some military contracts. Uh, they make good quality thread lock lockers. Uh, I find I get the Loctite stuff. I get the 243. I've had really good luck. Lasts me forever. That's what I like. Just me, my eye opinion. So that's that. Uh, yeah, and Josh needs to connect. Um, Art, if you send me an email, uh, info at Guns and Tactics with your info, I can introduce you to Josh and we can kind of go from there. Um, but yeah, they've had some uh, CCW classes with us, Sean, whatever. So Art, I'd be happy to make that introduction for you. Josh, hopefully you're okay with that. Uh, I like all 11s, 19, 20 11s, absolutely. Older model CZ, uh, Malawi. I don't even know where that is. Hmm, interesting, interesting, interesting. Uh, 2022 chain, mostly mill syrup AR stuff. Got it, got it, got it. All right, we're caught up on comments. We're coming up on the hour. Uh, maybe we should, uh, there's nothing here for tourism. All right, no offense, I won't. I, uh, I, won't, I won't come visit then. Uh, maybe we can organize a, a class down there, right? It'd be probably super expensive, though, because I'd have to bring a bunch of crap. Um, let's see here. Uh, what else we got for questions? I think we caught up on email questions. Oh, uh, Kevin did ask a question about urban police sniper stuff. Um, you know, and honestly, that probably could be a whole other topic where maybe I could bring in one of my sniper friends to talk about some of that. I've gone through a couple of LE sniper classes and things like that, but... Um, it would kind of be cool to have somebody with some more real world experience than me to maybe talk about some of that. So, um, yeah, but then we talked about equipment, about how 308 can last five to eight K rounds. Um, there are near zero successful uses of a police sniper in their environment around here. Um, I, again, I, you know, you're in Illinois somewhere, but I don't know exactly where, what their data is, but I know in Minnesota, we've had some LE sniper deployments. And then the person that I'm thinking of, um, he is a representative for the board of, um, the American Sniper Association for LE, and he could talk more into the into the nerd weeds on some of that stuff. So, uh, yeah, maybe that would be a good question there. Um, oh, hang on, let's see here, quick. Uh, where Art is a training group based based in SoCal, so probably not who you're thinking uh, regarding instructor inserts. Okay, there is a there was a FTA that was something else, but either way, send me an um, an email and where in SoCal are you? Uh, because I might be heading out to SoCal on a family vacation this fall, but maybe I could take a little bit of time off and, and go shoot or something. That'd be kind of cool. Do you think handguns wear out red dots fast enough that it warrants only using cheaper optics? No, cheaper optics will wear out faster because they can't hold up to the recoil and abuse. But that being said, more expensive optics wear out and get abused as well. Uh, I've had... Um, I've had issues breaking with all of them, you know, and uh, that's not a slam on anybody. Riding the, the slide of an optic is a hard life for, uh, or riding the slide of a handgun is a hard life for an optic, right? So I prefer the nicer ones, and then they have good warranties, things like that. Uh, but I have had more issues with some of the cheaper ones breaking down faster and things like that. Uh, huge lake in Malawi, like Lake Superior. Hey, does, uh, Trevor, we could use our dad joke about the Great Lakes. Get this guy. So I'm in Minnesota, and we just got back from a... Uh, North Shore ATV riding experience where I took the old Pioneer and we did some trails. The Safari Rig, as it got nicknamed, because it's not cool and sporty, but I'm really trying to be content. I'm looking at it right over here. I'm trying to be content with the old Greyhound uh, because I don't want to upgrade to a new Razor, even though I kind of do want to upgrade to a new Razor. So if anybody from Polaris is watching and you want to sponsor the show, let's talk. But anyways, um, yeah, so there are five Great Lakes, but only one is superior Get it? Lake Superior, which is technically an inland sea. I learned that as well. Okay. Sorry. Uh, when will Badger Ordnance be available at uh, Rainier? I don't know. I can look into that. What do you want to see us carry or whatever? So let me know. And yes, for those of you guys that don't know, I do work for Rainier. That's uh, kind of my main gig. Uh, I think I was going to talk about it last time, but 
I, I think we got distracted or I forgot or whatever, but I do work in the industry full time. Um, so I don't make any secrets about it or whatever. And let's see here. What else we got? Uh, Corona, basically within an hour of LA Corona, Corona. All right. Let me, um, is that North of LA Corona or is that South of LA? So yeah, let me know. But dudes, uh, we're going on a little over an hour. Uh, I think we've answered all the comments and the video quality is just absolutely atrocious. So hopefully you're listening to this and I apologize. We'll try to work on that for next time. I know somebody made a comment about wireless internet. Unfortunately, that's all I have out here, but usually I can stream just fine. And my speed test is still crazy fast. So, um, I, I don't know what I can do. Yeah. Oh, uh, Bob sent an email. Uh, Hardwire from your modem and switch. If I can, I will try to, but I, man, I don't know if I could drill that many holes and all that stuff. I don't, I don't know if that's an option, but I can look into it for sure. Uh, what else do I have for you guys? I think that's about it. I think we're caught up on comments. I think we're caught up on emails. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Sean got one in here at the last minute. What do I think of the uh, Zastava? M70. I have not shot it. I don't know, but I'll try to check one out. Maybe at a show or something, I'll, I'll check out the Zastava. Uh, I always feel like I'm pronouncing their name wrong. Zastava, Zastava, Zastava. I've heard it pronounced many different ways, and I don't know what the correct one is. It's kind of like with Holosun. Like, Josh, we've talked about this before. Is it Holosun? Is it Holosun? Is it Holosun? You know, like everybody pronounces things differently, right? So, uh, but yeah, I agree, man. I don't know what it is. Uh, I think honestly, a big part of it is now that my kids are home and they're on streaming on their devices. Um, maybe they are, even though I told my mesh system to prioritize my streaming device, it's clearly not doing that. So, and you know what the crazy thing is, is, uh, I bet you if I restarted a stream right after this one and I started it, it would be perfect, but that's just how it goes. That's just how it goes. All right, dudes, let's go ahead and pick a prize winner. Uh, again, huge thanks to our sponsor, Global Ordnance. They are supplying a awesome uh, package of Freedom Seeds to one lucky winner. You do have to be in the United States, all that other stuff. So I apologize, uh, Philip, if you win. I probably can't ship this prize out to you. Real quick, here are the rules. While you guys are looking at the rules, I'm going to go ahead and pick our random prize winner from the comments and emails using my random number generator. But by the way, nobody left me any super thanks. Just saying, I always appreciate that. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, geez. And Phil wants to know here. Let's uh, go back to the camera here. Phil wants to know when I'm moving to Kansas. Phil, it's not me. It's not me that you have to talk to. It's my wife. Hopefully you get to meet her. I'm trying to talk her into coming down to TriggerCon. But uh, you'll have to definitely ask her when we're moving down. All right. Uh, they're probably three. Yeah, exactly. They're probably playing video games, streaming, everything else, sucking up all the internet. So, uh, south of LA, north of San Diego, east of, oh my gosh, I, that's way too complicated. I think we are landing in Orange County. So maybe we'll see if we can link up. All right. Random number generator. Art, it landed on you. This was your comment, the competition influence world. So Art, send me an email anyway. And then we'll get a prize pack of uh, Freedom Seeds from our friends at Global Ordnance to Art. Again, thanks to our sponsor, Global Ordnance. We do really appreciate their support of the show. Guys, that is going to do it for all of the Patreon supporters. So if you wanted to support the channel, the best way is to contribute to us on our Patreon page. I know it's not the most active out there, but we do have different levels of support. If you just want to throw us a couple bucks every month, we would love to have it. Otherwise, we do have higher levels that will have better benefits as we grow the uh, Patreon level. And we'll have maybe some exclusives, some different giveaways, all that other stuff. So again, huge thanks to our patrons and our Patreon supporters. If you want to check that out, that is on Patreon. You can search for Guns and Tactics. The other thing I wanted to tell you guys, uh, I do have one other thing in the works that I can't really talk about just yet. Oh, Dustin, thank you very much. I appreciate the super thanks. Uh, huge shout out to Dustin. Uh, I feel like you shouldn't be giving me super thanks because I make you drive me around sometimes. Um, but uh, there is something in the works. There, There is something to maybe grow or merge guns and tactics with another entity out there that we're in early, early talks of. Currently don't have as much of a digital space as more of a traditional space. I'll, I'll leave some hints kind of vague at that, but we have been talking about how we can better work together to support what digital efforts we are doing on GNT. 
uh, because G and T, since I started doing this stuff more full time, which it's been a little over a year now, which is crazy how fast time flies. Uh, we've grown our Facebook page to almost a half million followers. We were at just under 300,000. Obviously, YouTube, we hit the big 100K milestone, which is just the start, I'm hoping. Uh, but we're hoping to keep working together, growing, all that kind of stuff. So I'll keep you guys posted as we know more about that. Uh, last and not least, I can't stress this enough to you guys. Uh, let's make TriggerCon the biggest yet. If you are in the Wichita, Kansas area or want to make it worth the trip, let's link up. We can meet up. Uh, I can give you guys, a, uh, a few of you guys, some tickets if you would actually use them. Uh, but send me an email if you would actually come to TriggerCon. I will have a link in this comment section below with a link that you can use to buy tickets. Tickets are only $25 for the arena show, $25 for range day, or you can get a bang for your buck package for $40. But TriggerCon is going to be an awesome event. I will be there. There's going to be other cool media influencers, companies, etc. I don't know if Josh from Holosun is going, but Holosun is going. You should go, Josh, by the way, if you're still watching. Uh, but let's link up. Let's hang out. Let's do whatever. If you know you're going to go, I can give away a few tickets. Send me an email, info at, or excuse me, the QA at gunsandtactics.com. I'll throw that on there right now. And oh my gosh, this is seriously, there we go. Uh, the QA at gunsandtactics.com. And, uh, you know, send me some emails, stuff like that. And I, if I can get you tickets, if you'd actually use them, I can give you guys a couple bang for your buck passes. Otherwise, everybody else, if you want to buy tickets, things like that, uh, please do so with the link and the code in the comment section in the description below. So, uh, dudes, I think that is going to wrap it up. We are over an hour. I think we're caught up on the comments. Art already uh, emailed in and he's got, uh, yeah, he's got his contact info here. So I'll send out some patches for you, Art, and then I'll also introduce you to Global so they can get your uh, prize. And uh, yeah, it'd be really cool to, to meet everybody. So guys, I can't thank you enough. I apologize for the audio glitches. Hopefully you can get this wherever you get your podcasts and also subscribe to us, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. Check out the website. With that, I'm going to sign off. I appreciate everybody's support. Thank you very much for watching and have a great day. I'm going to smile. This will be my thumbnail. And we're going to sign off. Take care, guys. Have a great uh, rest of your month. We'll check in with you guys next month for the live QA. Maybe we'll do another live one in the meantime. And uh, look forward to engaging with you guys as always. Seriously, one of the highlights of my month. Have a happy and safe Independence Day. I really mean that. Don't blow off your hand with some fireworks. And if you do, send me a picture because it'd probably be pretty cool. You'll have a cool story. But in all reality, I hope you don't do that. Guys, be safe. Have a good long weekend. We'll see you soon. Take care. All my best. Thanks for watching.